All right, Psalm 100. Psalm 100 tonight, we will pick back up with our series we started last week, a series entitled, The Joy of Serving yeah. Jesus, amen. And uh, I will not repeat uh, or recap all of last week's message. All of our messages are available in multiple different places. You can go back and watch them on the church's Facebook page. We Facebook Live everything. You can go back and watch it there. Uh, the messages, just the messages, not the song service, but just the messages are all on our church's YouTube channel. You can go watch it there. It's also on Sunday streams. And uh, then I put all of my notes on the church website. If you go to the resource tab, click over on outlines, and there's a drop down menu. You can go back and look at all the sermon notes with all the Bible verses, cross references, sometimes illustrations and jokes even are in there. Amen. So. All that's available for you if you missed it last Wednesday night. But tonight we're going to pick back up in part two. Who can tell me the title of last week's message? We can have joy in serving Jesus because of... Because of the unlimited potential that comes... How many of y'all got that right? All right. Amen. Great. And uh, so we looked last week at the unlimited potential... His word will not return void, Isaiah 55. I didn't even get really into all of that verse, talked about the seed and the sower. It's unlimited in the, it's in, in the scripture. It's unlimited in its potential. The, the scripture's unlimited uh, potential. The seed has unlimited potential, amen? Genesis 1-1, the seed is within itself. Yeah. When we put seed in the ground, we have no idea what the potential is of that seed. Right. Right. Amen. And I brought out the fact that the trees that are in your yard, if you have a yard, if you have trees in the yard, those trees, great, 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 great granddaddy were created in Genesis 1. You and I have no way of knowing when we pass out a track, when we give our testimony, when we invite somebody to church, they sit through the service, they sit through the, through the, through the bus ministry, uh, the junior church. We have no idea what God can do and when we ever begin to understand the unlimited potential that comes with serving the Lord, it's hard not to get excited. It's hard not to have joy about serving the Lord. And uh, I'm glad that this is a life, this is a life that we can have joy, we can have excitement. I, I, I was reading, uh, people were shocked when a, couple, uh, a key, uh, just a main football player announced his retirement, uh, uh, Andrew Luck with the uh, Indianapolis Colts, uh, it was one number one draft pick, uh, phenomenal uh, skill and talent as a football player, suffered a lot of injuries, and uh, just the other day, right in the middle of the game, uh, he retired. And uh, you know what he said? He said, it's not fun anymore. Right. I was reading today where uh, uh, Gronk, the Gronk, remember Gronk, Gronkowski? Yeah. For the, 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 the hated and despised Patriots. Yeah. Um, that that he, he retired right after the, they won the Super Bowl. You know what he said? He said, I lost joy in the game. Here's a man worth millions. Here's a man that was worshiped by millions of people. He had unlimited potential and skill, but he lost his joy in what so many people think, if I could ever get there, I'd have the joy, right? Well, he had it, and, and, uh, and he retired and quit. He said, I can't do it anymore. He said, I gotta live from, here's what he said, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta be selfish for a while. That's crazy. I read, I read that, I was like, is that what he said? He said, I have to be selfish for a while and think about me. I thought, okay, whatever. Man's worth millions of dollars, right? Doing something he said he loved doing. But what happened, he lost joy yeah. in something that since he was a kid, he worked so hard to attain. Yes, sir. But you know what, when you're, when you're serving the Lord, and it's not for money, and it's not for position and prestige and celebrity status, but you really understand serving the Lord with gladness, as our text says tonight, you realize there's absolutely unlimited potential, and that is exciting. It's exciting. But I'm not going to talk about what I preached last week, even though I just did. I want to move on to part two. We can have joy in serving Jesus because of unsurpassed privileges. Amen. The devil has nothing to offer yes, sir. Right. that can even come close to what you and I have the privilege of experiencing right. when we serve the Lord. Let's read our text tonight. If you know it from memory, you can quote it with me. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, 
all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Lord help us tonight. Over the next few moments, as we just expound these verses once again, I pray that you'd bring it all together in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I've only got two points tonight, two points, that's it. I knew we had a missionary, so I've only got two points. Now, one point's got like 18 subpoints, but I've only got two points tonight. So stay with me, all right? Uh, first thing I want you to notice that we have as an unsurpassed privilege of serving the Lord is we have an audience with God. Yes, sir. Now, I memorized Psalm 100 when I was probably five years old. I have known this verse from memory since the time I was a child. And yet, would you believe, as I was studying this passage of scripture today, God showed me something that I have never seen before. Amen. Now, if you've seen this before, act surprised. If you've seen this before, act like this is the first time you've ever heard this. But I want to say something that without a doubt, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the, one of the greatest benefits of serving the Lord. We always think about because I'm saved, I don't have to go to hell when I die, which is true. Praise the Lord for that. We could run all the way to Ohio and back just on that fact right there. I'm not going to hell. Amen. When I die, I don't have to worry about going to hell. I'm going to heaven. Praise the Lord. But can I tell you something? There's a whole lot more to serving the Lord and being a Christian than not just not going to hell, amen. And that is the life that we are privileged to live and enjoy while we're still here. Now, when you read verse number one, it's amazing how many people, when they read verse number one, they cringe or they're repulsed at the thought of making a joyful noise unto the Lord. I mean, it's like a, do I have to? Do I have to? I don't know how. I don't feel like it. I can't do that. I don't understand how I can do that during this time in my life. Make a joyful noise. And I think that when we read verse one, verse two, and verse number four, we have completely missed one of the unsurpassed privileges of serving the Lord, and that is we have God as our audience. We always focus on the make a joyful noise. We always are thinking about what we are supposed to do and what we have to do and what is expected of us and we completely miss that God is sitting there listening to it. That's awesome. I don't know why I missed these three places in our scripture where the Bible is very clear that we have a private audience with the creator of the universe. That's an amazing motivation to serve him. Amen. Look at verse one, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Come before verse two, his presence with singing. We go, oh man, I don't wanna come before his presence with singing. I don't know how to sing, I don't wanna sing. I don't feel like singing. I don't have a song in my heart right now. I don't have, I'm not in the mood. We're missing the fact that the God of heaven is our audience. Yeah. Verse four, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, if you can't get excited about the creator of the universe being your audience, that's, that's an unsurpassed privilege. People stand in line for hours to perform in front of the voice or America's Got Talent, or American Idol. They'll spend thousands of dollars on airfare and motels just to have an opportunity to audition in front of somebody that they think is good for two minutes. Are y'all getting this? 
and for them it will be the highlight of their life. This is the greatest moment of my life. I now am on the platform and I've got my celebrity hero who is some well-known uh, 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 artist or whatever. They, they are looking at me. They are listening to me. I am now going to be able to perform and do what I do and they are my audience and this is just the greatest moment of my life. What if we had that same attitude about making a joyful noise unto the Lord? What if we had that same attitude about enter into his gates with thanksgiving? and into his courts with praise. What if we had that same attitude during the song service coming before his presence with singing? It would absolutely transform our church. Congregational numbers called, grab a hymn book, turn to page so and so, the musicians tear off on the introduction and all together on the first verse and a lot of times half the people in the church are staring around, looking around. We have an audience with the creator. Amen. He's looking at us and going, give it your best. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. I'm all ears. That's awesome. Is everybody still with me? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about how many of y'all have thought about it like that. I'm sure many of you have. But that hit me today in such a fashion that we have a negative attitude about something that is absolutely unbelievably positive. Right, right, amen. Serving the Lord with gladness. How can I serve the Lord with gladness? Because it's the Lord we're talking about. How can we not have energy? How can we not have passion? How can we not put our heart into it? How can we not put our soul into it? How can we not put forth our best foot forward and put our best effort into something when the Lord God Almighty is our audience? You can tell the difference in a choir when they realize they're singing to the Lord or if they're just up there singing because they have to. You can tell the difference when there's a soloist or a duet or a quartet and they're singing because their name came up on the cue card this week and oh well, I drew the short straw, I guess it'll be us. We better get something together. We gotta get together, we gotta practice. We're supposed to sing Sunday night. We're supposed to sing Sunday morning. We gotta get together. We gotta run over something. Or come before his presence with singing. And we're in such awe that we get to serve the Lord. <laughs> Amen. How can we read verse one, verse two, and verse four and not see the unsurpassed privilege of having the God of heaven as our audience and he's listening he's listening I wonder how many of us are going to make it to the next round based on our audition he hears our joyful noise verse 1 by the way he hears our joyful noise regardless of our land Make a joyful noise in the Lord, all ye lands. In other words, your accent. That helped me, that helped me, that helped me. That helped me. I know, I talk like a hit. I, I give up trying not to. It sounds worse when I try not to. The only thing worse than a Yankee accent is a hillbilly talking like a Yankee or trying to not talk like a hillbilly. And I'm not saying y'all have a Yankee accent, but you definitely don't have a hillbilly accent. I bet you you don't have to have somebody every day ask you, where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? I hear it every day of my life. Where are you from? Where are you from? Just look at them. I don't even know you. Why do you want to know where I'm from? I can walk in a restaurant and I'll place an order. They're like, where are you from? I'm like, punch the buttons on the thing. I'm ready to go. Where are you from? Make a joyful noise in the Lord, all ye lands. There's people up in the northeast corner of Brazil making a joyful noise in Portuguese. 
And God's saying, bring it on. Amen. Over in the Philippines, over in India, Pakistan, Mexico, Dominican, amen, wherever. All you lands. And we have an audience. Just let that sink in. The next time you're singing in church or the shower, How many of you sing in the shower? How many of you, when you're singing, the water goes back up in the shower head? <laughs> Man, I'm standing over here during the song service, and I'm just singing, and I'm just singing, and Brother Replo goes over here like, why you got your back to me? Do I sing that bad? I'm like, yeah, you got to sing that bad. Yeah. No, he doesn't sing that bad. I don't know how he's, I don't sing to him. I don't listen to him. God's listening to him. I'm just singing to the Lord. Sometimes I'm even louder than the song leader and he's got a microphone. And I'm singing the wrong words and everybody's following me instead of him. I'm just singing to the Lord. I sing in the truck. I come to church horse. I sing in the truck. (laughs) I sing by myself. I come in here sometimes, get on the piano, just play and sing. People walk in, I stop and I'm like, go, go, go. Singing to the Lord. I'll be right in the middle of studying a message and I'll just, a song will come to my heart and I'll just come in here and sit down and play and sing and get it out of my system and go on back in there and study. Amen. Yeah. We have an audience. Yeah. I'm gonna say that to some of y'all get it. It's amazing. He hears our joyful noise. It might just be a noise. Right. But if it's joyful, he likes it. Yeah. Amen. Now if it's not joyful, he probably doesn't. I don't know. But if you're enjoying it and you're serving the Lord and you've got a spring in your step and you recognize who it is you're singing to, he likes it. It goes from a joyful noise in verse one to singing in verse two. Some people can sing. Some people can't sing. Some people have a beautiful voice. They just tear it all to pieces getting it out. It doesn't matter. God doesn't care. God wants to hear you sing. You see, the joy, you see the progression? It goes from a joyful noise in verse one to singing in verse two. Then he hears our thanksgiving in verse four. He hears our praise. That's how it translates to God. It's thanksgiving and praise. If it's done with joy. Number two, not only do we have an audience, but we have an assurance. An assurance. You know, that's one thing the world does not have is that assurance that comes with knowing God. People that are haunted by doubts and uncertainties, their life is just one question mark after another. One, just one unknown, one mystery, one huge, vast chasm of uncertainty and despair and doubt. We as Christians don't have that. We have assurance. These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Assurance of salvation. Let's look at our text. Let's break this down. Let me give you four subpoints quickly. Number one, we have an assurance of his person. Look at what it says in verse three. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Yes. Yes. He is God. You go on these missions trips. If you've never been on one, you ought to go. If you've never been on a missions trip, you ought to go. It'll absolutely change your life. Not that we don't have idolatry here, but it's really prominent in other places. You go to third world countries and they're they're worshiping graven images. They're worshiping statues. They're worshiping whatever. And they don't know for sure that what they're doing is working. Which is one reason why they are so faithful because they're trying their best to counteract all of their uncertainties and doubts. Yes, sir. Exactly right. You go to places like India that's got 30 million gods. 30 million gods. You got to wonder if there's any professor of theology in any of those universities that know all the gods' names. I mean, how does that even work? Do they break them down into a pie chart and just study like one segment of them? How does that even work? How would you like to wake up every morning trying to please that many gods? 
There's no way you can even know their names or anything about them or what they demand or what they expect. And there's got to be a perpetual feeling of insufficiency and failure in everybody's heart and mind. There has to be. You go to the Philippines and they nail themselves to the cross at Easter and they whip themselves until they're bleeding. They crawl on glass down in Mexico, crawl on glass. We went down to see Brother Estep and he showed us, we went to a, a, a religious site there right outside of the city of Lyon. And there is a path, a winding path up to the top of this mountain. Not a little hill, not like the hill across the street over here where the cemetery is. I'm talking about a mountain, a little winding road made out of cobblestone. Cobblestone. And people crawl from the bottom of that mountain to the top on their knees to go up there and pray to an idol. I mean, it took us 20 minutes to drive to the top of that mountain. And we got to the top and there were people on their knees crawling across that pavement. Of course, many of them, different levels of sincerity and devotion. Some of them just get up there to the smooth tiled part and crawl. But many of them during throughout the year, different events and holidays, pilgrimages will make that entire trek on their knees on cobblestone to pray to a graven image. And you and I can talk to the God of heaven in our bedroom on our carpeted floor anytime we want to. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. And we don't have this empty hope. We have an assurance that our Lord is the one true God. They don't have that. We have that. I'm talking about how we can have joy in serving Jesus. How can we get excited about serving the Lord because we know that our Lord, he is God. The one we serve, the one we worship, the one we pray to, the one we preach about, the one we talk about, the one we sing to, the one we testify about, he is the one true God and we know that for a fact. How can you not have joy when we know that the Lord, he is God? God, we're assured of his person. Secondly, we are assured of his purpose. Boy, this hit me like a ton of bricks today. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Right. Well, I can do what I want to do. No, you can't, sir. I can live whatever way I want to live. No, you cannot, ma'am. I'll do whatever I please. No, young person, you cannot because it is he that hath made you and not yourself. He had a purpose. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And God had a purpose for your life. When he made you, he had a plan and he had a purpose. You and I, when we recognize that our Lord, he's God, then all of a sudden we look at everything from his perspective. It is he that hath made us got my whole life ahead of me. Let me see here. What do I want to be? What do I want to do? No, you're going about that all wrong. Parents, we need to help our kids with this. We need to stop asking them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we need to ask them, what does God want you to be when you grow up? What does God want you to be when you grow up? What does God want you to do when you grow up and drill it into their head. Now, it could be this Sunday in junior church. It could be this Sunday night. It could be this Wednesday night when God shows you what he wants you to do. So you need to sit up and pay attention and listen. God might tell you what your career path is going to be. He might tell you what your future holds. Now, it might be when you're a kid. As the missionary said, he's got a couple of young people in his family that says, I want to be a missionary wife to, uh, to Japan, or I want to be a, a missionary, I want to be a preacher. But as you get older, God spoke to me in fourth grade about preaching. Fourth grade. Fourth grade. I felt a very strong desire to preach. And I went to my dad. I said, Daddy, I feel like God wants me to preach. Daddy said, God knows where you're at. If he wants you to preach, he'll come back and tell you. It's one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me. And I pushed it to the back of my mind. I wasn't running. I wasn't, I wasn't running from God. I was in fourth grade. Right, right. 
I was about eight years old, right? And I pushed it to the back of my mind at the age of 21. And back up at 15, I wanted to go into, I was thinking about the military. I was thinking about the military. I wanted to go into the military. I was obsessed with the military. 15, 16, I'm obsessed with the military. And the Holy Spirit of God came to me and said, no, not you. Not that, not you, not that. I love the military. Love it. To this day, I love it. I was 15, the Lord said, not you, not that. When I was 21, God called me to preach. And I realized it is he that hath made me and not we ourselves. Right. And we have assurance. I'm gonna tell you something. If you don't have the assurance of God's call and plan on your life, you're not going to do much. That's right. Amen. Amen. Is everybody still with me? Number three, moving on. We're assured, thirdly, of his people. The Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, we. Look around. Look around. Look around. We are his people. Now, you say, preacher, what is so, why is that so important? Because if you listen to the world, they think we're a bunch of weirdos. Right. Amen. If you listen to the world, they describe us as a bunch of losers, a bunch of lunatics. If we still believe the Bible, if we still believe in creation, if we still believe Jesus is the only way, we still believe that there, there, there's, a, that there's a God in heaven, if we still believe in reaching souls, if we still believe in raising young people uh, to get married virgins and having a godly home and, 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 and we still believe in the institution of marriage between a man and a woman, if we still believe these things, they think we're a bunch of weirdos, but look around. We have assurance tonight that we are his people. We should have that assurance, not in a proud, conceited, arrogant, condescending way, but just that assurance in our heart when everybody's telling us we're wrong and everybody's telling us that our beliefs are outdated and everybody's telling us that we ought to be quiet and sit down and shut up, we have assurance that we are his people. And they're the ones floundering, trying to find their identity. And we know who we are. We are his people. Now that might not do much for you, but it blessed the daylights out of me today. We are his people. And I'd rather be God's people yeah. than anybody else's people. Yes, sir. God's people are the best people. We're flawed. I said we are flawed. Right. Yeah. We got issues. We got hang-ups. We got baggage. We got problems. But we're his people. <laughs> Amen. And I'm thankful for that. We are his people. 1 Peter 2.10, which in time past were not a people. 1 Peter 2.10, which in time past we were not a people, but now are the people of God. Amen. Fourthly and lastly, we have an assurance of his provision. Listen to what it says in the next verse. Or the end of the verse. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I'm thankful tonight that I graze in the pasture of the one true God. Amen. I'm thankful that I graze in the pasture of the Lord. He is my shepherd. And his pasture is satisfying. That's why David said, the Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. I'm so thankful tonight that I can have way down deep inside when I'm surrounded by turmoil, <clears throat> chaos, uncertainty. Every day, the headlines, they just milk it for all it's worth. Uncertainty. Never in my life seen media personalities try their best yeah. to talk us into a recession. Amen. A recession. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have a recession. You better watch out now. We're going to have a recession. We're going to have one. And you're sitting there and you don't even have any money, but you're like, I don't even know what that means, but it don't sound good. Am I lose my job, lose my house. All the uncertainty. China, what's going to happen with China? What's going to happen with North Korea? What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. And the whole world has just got the jitters about everything. 
about everything. Terrorism, shootings, mass shootings. Everybody's just like this all the time. But guess what? I have assurance. I'm his people. I'm living his purpose. I know who he is. And I'm in his pasture. I'm eating his grass, drinking his water. And I'm happy. I've got joy. See, it don't look like we're winning right now. Does it? Do you read the headlines? Watch the news? Does it, does it look like we're winning? Hmm. See, we, we know how the story ends. We know how the story ends. Good guy wins, bad guy spends eternity in, in the bottomless pit. Yeah. Amen. And God sends one angel, one, one angel, bind him up, cast him in the bottomless yeah. pit, done. Yeah. Done. Lake of fire, done. And God sits on the throne forever and ever. Eternal kingdom. And we, his people, are going to be right there with him. Yeah. See? So when we have that assurance, there's no reason why we can't have joy. There's no reason why we can't serve the Lord with gladness. We don't have to walk in dragging our feet. We don't have to walk in with the mullet grubs. We don't have to live our life. I'm a Christian. Woe is me, I'm a Christian. No, no, no. Life's too short to live that way. And God's too good to live that way. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.